right. Good morning, Park Cities. How are you? Good. I love the call and response. Good morning. How are you? Merry Christmas. I think we, it's safe to say that we're right in the middle of December. Uh, some of you might be tired of hearing Christmas music. Well, who am I kidding? No one's tired of hearing Christmas music. Some people, I know some of you even listen to Christmas music in the summer. Um, that's kind of weird, actually. But uh, I actually start as early as like October sometimes. Uh, Christmas is just a wonderful time. It's been awesome so far. I hope you've been blessed throughout this month. Uh, I was just thinking as I was preparing this message about a year ago today, uh, around this time, uh, Luna and I were looking for a, a church family, a church home family, and man, we had a lot of questions about where we would be, uh, some anxiety, wondering where God would send us, um, and little did we know that God had Park Cities in mind, and so we've been super blessed to be a part of this community for the past year, and uh, man, I, I just I want to thank you all for allowing Luna and myself to, to feel so at home here at Park Cities, because it's really been a wonderful, wonderful year for us. And so uh, we, we're so grateful, and we want to just say that, but we also want to welcome y'all. Some of you may not have a church home family. Some of you may be uh, looking for a home church. We hope that you'll find that here. But we, for the time being, we just want to say welcome, and it's so great to see y'all. Uh, let's pray, church. I want to ask God to fill our hearts uh, just, just with his goodness as we continue to worship the Lord. And let's ask God to open our minds so that we can receive his word. So let's pray together. God, thank you so much uh, for this holiday season. Lord, we're, we're so grateful that in this season, uh, Lord, that we can experience joy and hope and peace as we've talked about in weeks past. Um, Lord, and we can do that, Lord, as a church family. God, I pray that as we dive into your word today, that we would continue to give you honor to give you glory, Lord, and, and as we sing praises to you, Lord, as we, as we learn, I pray that we would continue to grow in your, in your word. So God, thank you for everything that you've done. Be with us today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we are right in the middle of our Christmas series entitled, Come Home to Christmas, and you know, for so many of us, Christmas is indeed a joyous season because there is comfort and familiarity in the coming of in, in coming home. Really, some of you may be uh, preparing to go home from work or from school. Uh, maybe you're expecting out of town relatives to come home, uh, but there's a comfort and familiarity with that. And just as there's a sense of home with uh, the seeing of family. Uh, in the Christmas season, as people come together in a shared location, uh, there's also a sense of familiarity and comfort uh, as, as people encounter the gospel through uh, the birth of Jesus, our Savior. And this is at really the heart at Park Cities. And what we hope to do through this holiday season is for the believer to bring you home to what is familiar, uh, to the foundations of what you believe to be true. And also, even for the not yet saved, to introduce you to the home that is waiting for you, that is waiting for you as you discover the gospel through the birth of Jesus, which is really what Christmas is all about. Now, as I thought about this year's Christmas, the idea of home is kind of an interesting one. Um, it, it's, it's a concept that feels kind of far away, but we all want that, but we're not really sure if we're there because I think this year, because of the way it's gone, it's kind of skewed our perspective on what home ought to be. Now, spiritually speaking, uh, for me and I think a lot of others, it might, there might have been some confusion this year because foundational things it, it somehow have lost its comfort. Things like hope and peace and joy uh, maybe don't, don't mean the same things to us. Maybe it's because it's been so confusing. Well, today, as we, walk, as we talk about coming home to joy, my hope is that you will not only understand what it means to experience it, but that you will experience it for yourself as we see the story of Jesus' birth. Well, I want to zero in on the, on the topic of joy for today. And as you might know, joy and happiness are not quite the same thing. And one of the things that I want to to pound the table on is, this, is to, to know that more than ever before, 
we really truly need a God-centered understanding of what joy is. And so to be clear on what joy is, before we continue on, uh, I'd like to actually read for you a quote by Randy Alcorn. He's an author and pastor, and I love what he says about joy. And he says this, Joy is something entirely different from happiness. Joy in the biblical context is not an emotion. Joy brings us peace in the middle of a storm. Joy is something that God deposits into us through the Holy Spirit. There is a big difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is an emotion and temporary. Joy is an attitude of the heart. I love that. Joy is an attitude of the heart. Church, I want us to hold on to that idea as we continue on in this message. And would also further elaborate and say that God's desire is not to make us happy or comfortable, but rather to help us find joy as a result of our relationship with him. I'm going to say that again because I think that's, it's a foundational truth that I really want us to hold on to. God's desire is not to make us happy or comfortable, but rather to help us find joy as a result of our relationship with him. Well, today we'll be looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And as you're turning there, I want to mention that we have been looking at this passage for the past two weeks, talking about coming home to hope and coming home to peace. But I would like to argue and say that actually when you read Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20, this is a passage about joy. This is a passage about joy where there is joy embedded throughout this passage. And I believe the same could be said of our Christmas season, despite the fact that it might have been a tough year for so many of us. So before we dive into the message today, I'd like to say something that I think applies not just to today, but really the whole Christmas season. And that is that everything that is said from the pulpit, and if you haven't seen the previous messages, please go back And listen, because those words matter. Today's words matter. The words you will hear in the next coming weeks will matter. And the reason why is because I look at 2020 and I see how crazy it's been. And the one word that I'm going to use to describe this year is confusing. Where up is down, down is up, left is right, and right is left. The other day I was looking at COVID numbers. And I found myself thinking, well, the numbers aren't as bad as the other day. No, they're horrible. They're objectively horrible. And so I, I've almost, I almost felt like I was, being, I was being numbed to the horrible things that are happening in the world. And I felt like, wow, I, I, I'm, I'm totally not seeing it. 2020 has totally skewed our perspective on our foundations, on the things that should matter, the truth of what is good, objectively good and objectively bad. And I want us to understand that when we come to church, when we talk about Christmas and we come home, we come home to hope, when we come home to peace, when we come home to joy, and when we come home to love, we are going back to our foundations because that's where we need to be so that our minds are not skewed, so that that, that we're, we're continually coming back to the gospel, that good is objectively good and we know it, we feel it, and we believe it, and we pursue after that, that we are not numb to those things. And so I I believe what we're saying in this holiday season, it matters. It matters, especially this year. So today we're talking about joy. We're talking about joy. And so today we're saying that joy is seen in the arrival of God. Joy is seen in the presence of God. And joy is seen in the sharing of God. So let's talk about the arrival, the arrival of God. The verse before our Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 20 passage is the moment our long-awaited Savior had arrived. Look look with me, verse 7, the verse before that passage. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the hostel. Now, if you hadn't noticed, in the description of joy that I mentioned earlier, there is a distinct connection between joy and peace. Alcorn actually said it. I don't know if you caught it. Alcorn said that joy brings us peace in the middle of a storm. 
And I would go further and say that you can't have joy unless peace is in that equation. And peace is something that allows us to have joy in greater abundance. Amen? And I want to bring this connection to your attention because I want to say that the unrest that was present in the relationship between mankind and God, they breathed a collective sigh of relief when Jesus arrived. The sigh of relief was both because there would be peace and now joy as our relationship with God would have a way to be restored. Now there is great joy when someone you love and long for arrives. Maybe some of you know what that's all about. You know, I think about my typical day and how it actually is a challenge to leave home. Uh, You know, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, but every single day when I'm leaving home, um, I feel a tug on my shirt. It's, it's Luna holding on to my shirt as I'm leaving, and I'm literally having to pull, pull away from her in order to get to my car, into the garage, and, and out. So if, if that's the way I describe the beginnings of my day, imagine what the house is like when I come home at the end of the day. There is joy in Luna's eyes, and I can only imagine joy in my eyes. And there are some days, I kid you not, where she is jumping up and down. I mean, it's, it's kind of fun. It's a little bit embarrassing. I know it's a little embarrassing to, to talk about it. But it's a real example, though, of joy in my everyday life that comes on the heels of a form of longing and waiting. And I want to mention that because I, Jesus' birth was not just some random event in history, but his arrival was long awaited, church. Over 400 prophecies and foreshadowings of Christ throughout the Old Testament revealed this. The birth of Jesus would be the beginning of a major shift of all of man and his relationship with an eternal God. This was all foretold hundreds of years before the events of Luke chapter 2, verse 7. A great example is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. We actually looked at this passage uh, last week. Uh, it, it says this, For a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. Let me just stop there. Last week, Pastor Jeff talked about this. He said uh, the word for peace, the, the shalom. It's, it's actually, the idea is the wholeness of God, the, the wholeness that we feel when we are in shalom. And so I think this is a great translation of that word, um, but, but we'll, we'll have to equate that with um, anywhere we see wholeness, we'll, we'll see peace. So Prince of Wholeness, his ruling authority will grow, and there'll be no limits to the wholeness, to the peace he brings. He'll rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. He'll put that kingdom on a firm footing and keep it going with fair dealing and right living beginning now and lasting always, the zeal of God of the angel armies will do all this. Amen? Sound familiar to you? This sounds like Jesus to me. Is all of this directly connected to this moment in history in Luke chapter two? I know that joy does not depend on what happens, but it does depend on what happened here in this passage. And if there ever was a happening that should prompt joy, church, this is it. The long-awaited Savior has come to restore us. Amen? The long-awaited Savior had come to restore our relationship with a holy and eternal God. This is a big moment in history and long awaited. Plainly speaking, in this season, our joy should come from what happened in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And in light of that, doesn't Luke chapter 2, verses 13 through 14 make a little bit more sense? Look with me, verse 13 and 14. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises, glory to God 
in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. Amen. Amen. Now there is joy because the long-awaited Savior had come, but there is also joy because the Emmanuel God would be with us as well. You know, in this scene, as the shepherds in Bethlehem were uh, watching their flock, uh, they were met with a surprise visitor. Look with me, verses 10 through 12. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A savior has just been born in David's town, a savior who is Messiah and master. So the birth of Jesus would indeed be good news of great joy, uh, given what Jesus came to accomplish. But I think there's significance in the fact that shepherds were given this good and history-altering news, which I want to pause for a moment and talk about that a bit. Uh, you know, the shepherds were not particularly esteemed during this time. Uh, they were actually seen as sort of untrustworthy. In fact, an example of this is that, you know, any time their testimony was used in a court of law, it would actually be thrown out because they were just seen as unreliable and sometimes dishonest. But these shepherds had the honor of hearing the fact that a savior had been born. And I believe that these particular shepherds were noble. Uh, as this news would not have been good news unless they were not really looking for a savior. So I believe these shepherds were chosen to hear this good news because they were not only humble, but they would likely understand the implications of someone who would be known as the Christ. And let's remember, church, there, there's great joy in the good news of God because of who had arrived. Who had arrived? The angel proclaimed that a savior had come who is Christ the Lord, as some versions have, have translated it. Christ means the anointed one in the Greek and, or the one who has all of God's power to, to speak and act. Also understood to be the Messiah as we see in the message version as we just read. Now this would be good news, church, because this means that Jesus would come to save mankind, not from Roman rule, but from the sins of that kept us from a right relationship with an eternal God. This was also good news because this would mean that we could have the presence of God and experience his fellowship as well. In fact, in the Matthew account of this story, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, we're reminded of the fact that Jesus would be known as Emmanuel. It says, watch for this, a virgin will get pregnant and bear a son. They will name him Emmanuel, in the Hebrew for God is with us. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have God with us? Well, it means that he has come down from heaven to not only be with us physically in this point in history, in, in this moment in time, but that his presence would be with us going forward through his Holy Spirit. I know that with uh, the holidays coming up, uh, many of us are making plans to, to travel. How many of you guys are traveling this holiday season? Good number of you. Uh, some of you are just staying home, and that's, that's cool. I think Luna and I talked about possibly going out of town. I have a sister in Cleveland. Of course, her family, her entire family's in Korea. And so we even at one point talked about uh, seeing them. And man, it, it, it's hard, you know, to, to make plans like that, especially during this time. So we're actually going to stay in Dallas. So for those of you sticking around in Dallas, I'm with you. I'm with you. So uh, I understand being at home. Now, I, I know that uh, there are some people uh, who will not only not be with family away from Dallas, but they're just, you're just not going to be with anybody. You, you might find yourself alone on Christmas. And trust me, I know what that's like. I know exactly what that's like because I experienced that uh, not too long ago. Um, I, it was in my seminary years. I was in, I was in Fort Worth in seminary, and uh, I found myself all by myself. <laughs> in my apartment, by myself, on Christmas week, uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day as well. Uh, I, I was one of the worship leaders on staff. I was, I was one of the interns, and all the other worship leaders had already made plans to go out of town, and uh, it just ended up that way where I, I was just the kind of the lone man uh, manning the fort, and I was happy to do it. It just, that's just the way that things ended up, but man, it was a bummer. <laughs> I can't tell you how miserable 
I was that Christmas. I, I remember uh, sitting in my apartment and the heater was broken, of course, right? The heater was broken. I was huddled around my hot pot, uh, boiling my last packet of instant ramen. That's how I spent my Christmas Eve. And I was just miserable, uh, miserable because I was thinking, man, everyone else got to go out of town. I'm the only one who's here. I can't believe it. Man, I, I can't be with my family. I can't go travel. It, it was a miserable Christmas. And I, and I have to say that that's where my mind was for the whole week. Christmas Eve, the 23rd, Christmas Eve and the Christmas Day. My mind, I can't go home. Why can't I go home? Oh my gosh, this is the worst Christmas ever. And I was so bent on going home for Christmas that I neglected to find home where I was at that moment. And looking back, I had indirectly led myself to believe that home was a place when in fact it was found in presence. It's found in presence. And I realized that in a way I'd regrettably spent more time bummed out that I couldn't travel back home rather than spending it in God's presence. So even more than the presence we get or even the travel that comes with time off, when we find ourselves surrounded by loved ones and more importantly, the one who came down to be with us, our Emmanuel, you will understand how presence can be joy, how presence can be joy. So regardless of what your circumstances look like, maybe you are planning on spending Christmas alone. If that is your circumstance, regardless of your circumstance, make sure you get yourself in the presence of God to experience joy. And I believe that you will. You know, going forward, I, I committed full time to being in the ministry at that point. And I said, look, I really hope I don't have to spend Christmas alone ever again. But turns out every Christmas after that, I hadn't been able to see family. As many of you know, ministry is really busy around the holidays. And so I was not really able to go home until after New Year's. And I have to say that it, it wasn't that I got used to being alone in Christmas, but that I, I learned to be in the presence of God during that time. And some of my best memories of Christmas in the past 10 years of my life were when I was in the presence of God. Not just going to church, but spending time with God during that week, devoting that time to being in his presence and experiencing the joy that I, I inevitably experienced every single year. And so my hope and my prayer is that you will experience the exact same joy as you spend your Christmas, whether with family or without. So lastly, we see here that joy is in the sharing of God. I want to move forward here. And we see this at the end of the passage. And I really love this part because you can really see joy. And you can see what I mean when I say that joy is embedded throughout this passage. Look with me, verse 15 through 20. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the sheep herders were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear deep within herself. The sheep herders returned and let loose glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they'd been told. Amen. Now, if you remember our Fruit of the Spirit series, our series before this, we talked about joy being one of those fruits. And I love this message. I love that message. If you go back and you can watch it again, uh, because we said that joy is like the orange because you know, once you get into it, it just goes everywhere, right? You get into an orange, it goes everywhere. And I love that because that's, that describes and reveals the nature of joy and what it inevitably does. And we see a picture of that in Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 20. Well, today's teaching was about finding joy in this story in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. And we said that we find joy in the arrival of God, in the presence of God, and also in the sharing of God. Well, if you think about these points 
And also what I would mentioned earlier in the intro is, is I talked about how 2020 has been a really odd year and really confusing is the word I would use. It really points to one truth and really what I hope we can walk out of here with. And it's this, my hope for you church is that you set your eyes on Jesus who is the foundation of all life giving joy. That's really what I hope we leave here with that we set our eyes on Jesus, who is the foundation of all life-giving joy. We need Jesus at our foundation, amen? We need him there, regardless of the kind of year you've had, confusing, horrible, devastating even, we need Jesus at the foundation. And I hope that as we talked about Luke chapter two here, that that it's brought you back home to that familiar place of the gospel message where there is hope, where there is peace and where there is joy. You know, this passage ends with these shepherds glorifying and praising God as the ESV reads, but I really like how the message puts it. I mean, it it really puts it well. It says the sheep herders returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. So church, as we've read in verse 10, you have now heard the good news of great joy that will be for all people. Now, as we are let loose, my hope is that we would go from this place glorifying and praising God for everything he has done. We're gonna experience great joy when we share Christ and all that he has done. Regardless of the kind of year you've had, I believe God has been good to you. I believe he he has given you more than one reason to rejoice and to praise him. This is something we ought to share. The joys that you've experienced in 2020, I want you to go and share, be let loose from this place to share with others what God has done in your life. And in this season, in this Christmas season, we have an awesome opportunity to share joy with people as we let loose, or we are let loose with the good news. A, f- a few simple ways that we can do this. Uh, well, first of all, we, you can invite your friends to church as they are comfortable, of course. Um, But we also have um, a really fun event, and Travis mentioned this uh, in the announcements, but we have uh, Christmas on the lawn, uh, family on the lawn. We we have cocoa, we have carols, we have snow. Yes, snow, you can bet there will be snow there. Um, And uh, it's just gonna be a great event where you can invite your friends and family. Also, we have, um, uh, on the 24th, uh, we will have a digital Christmas expression, Christmas Eve at the Cliff House, online worship. We actually recorded this this past week um, and it, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, we're gonna have worship, we're gonna have scripture reading and of course the gospel message. What a great opportunity to share Christ with the people that you love and, and your friends, your coworkers, anybody who needs to hear this message of hope, this message of joy, uh, I encourage you to share it with them um, as we get closer to the holiday season. And all that info, of course, you can find on our site, pcbc.org. Now, I wanna spend some time praying for y'all as we close out, as we are let loose, I wanna pray for y'all. You know, I, I think maybe joy is, is kind of a hard topic uh, for some of us, maybe because we haven't had such a great year. And you're looking at me you're saying, well, Han, yeah, joy's all nice and warm and fuzzy and all, but that's just not the way I roll. This this has not been that kind of year, I'm sorry. But you know, there's a command that says rejoice, rejoice always, that's a command. And so my hope is that we would experience joy truly, not not a forced joy, not a joy just because we heard it at church, but a joy because we truly are happy and joyful that our savior, our long awaited savior had come. And so so my hope is that you will experience joy in your deepest core. Now, I wanna pray for you. And before we go into that time of prayer, I I wanna kind of name a few categories of people because I I realize that there are people in this room and also watching online um, who may be listening with a different set of ears. Yeah, perhaps you're one of those cynical folks who 
It just Joy just doesn't register with you. I want to pray for you. I want to also pray for those who are maybe too busy to experience joy. Maybe in the holiday season, you're just running around, and I know I've experienced that the past two weeks. Um, and, and it's hard to experience joy when there is, when there is a hectic schedule in front of you. I, I know. But my prayer is that you will take time to pause, to be still, to experience God's presence so that you will truly know what joy is because it's found in his presence. For those of you maybe who are not yet saved, I mentioned this in the beginning, those who are not yet saved, I wanna pray for you as well. There is a home waiting for you. There's a home waiting for you that can be known through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this story of Jesus being born, I hope you can see that this was a long awaited event that all of mankind had been waiting for. And it's still relevant today. And so if you don't know Jesus today, if, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, I, I just want to pray for you. If you have questions, we have people here who are more than happy to talk to you. Ask us questions. We want to be there for you so that uh, you will know uh, the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in the gospel, Jesus had come to live a perfect life that we could not live. And he died on the cross for us, a death that he did not deserve for us so that our sins could be paid for so that we can have a right relationship with the holy God, a God who knows you and loves you. And so if you desire a relationship with a God like that, I wanna pray for you and let us know if there's anything we can do to answer questions and to pray over you. But if you fall into any one of those categories, I know I said a lot, but if anything that I said registered to you, I just want you to place your hand over your heart. I just wanna pray over you and pray that you would experience joy in this season. So let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for the joy that you give, for bringing us back home to the foundations of what we believe, God, as believers, this gospel message that should prompt joy in every single one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for sending your son to die for us, to live that perfect life that we could never live so that we can have eternal life. And so, Lord, we pray for those who have not had a joyful year, who have not had a joyful season. I pray that they would know joy, not through their circumstances or their happenstance, but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that they would experience joy through your presence, through the presence of friends and family that they have. And even for those who are not going to be around family and friends, I pray that their joy would be experienced in abundance through your presence. God, I pray for those who do not know you. I pray that, that they would make a decision to follow you. Lord, I, I know that in Romans chapter 10, it says that we all we need to do is call upon the name of the Lord and we will be saved. And so there are people, Lord, I believe, wanting to call out to you as Lord and Savior to trust you with their lives. We are not saved by our good works, but we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, if there's anyone who is making that decision today, I pray that you would walk with them. Give them courage to ask questions so that we can walk with them as they begin their relationship with you and come home to your joy and to your love. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. We pray all of this in Jesus' name.